so my talk is uh, on algebraic combinatorics. So it's a little bit different from the other talks in this conference, uh, but it is related to W algebras and everything. Um, okay, uh, so really the, the talk is about characters of W3, 3P prime models, but that's a clickbait. I put in W algebras because then experts might be interested. But in any case, this is, I would really like to think about these as principal characters of standard SL3 hat modules. Uh, but when you want to compare these to the W algebra and the SL3 hat, you need a restriction that um, the parameters three and P prime need to be co prime to each other. Um, so I don't like that pesky restriction. So I would much rather think about um, all of that I'm going to talk about as principal characters of SL3 hat module. So I'll explain what I mean by principal characters. Um, I don't really understand physics, but these character, these VOAs are also some VOAs that underlie certain RGS Douglas theories. And there is a paper by Cordova and Shao where, um, well, these VOAs conjecturally underlie some RGS Douglas theories, and the conjecture is supported by the calculation of the sure indices. And um, the sure indices exactly match the characters of, of these VOAs. Um, even that is not proved yet that I think in their paper, they, they just verified it up to a certain power of Q. Anyway, so these characters might be of interest to you if you think about those um, types of things. Okay. Um, all right, so let me set up some preliminaries. Uh, since this is a algebraic combinatorics type talk, I'll need some notations from Q series. Um, so you saw this Pokhammer symbol in previous talk on yesterday, but in context of some line bundles. But anyway, uh, this Pokhammer symbol is, I'll understand it purely formally. Um, so you have, a, you have a formal variable A, a formal variable Q, and this J here, uh, that just tells you how many factors you include. So you start at one minus A and you include J minus one, but sorry, total J factors, which means you end at J minus one. Uh, you can set that A to be equal to Q, you get this, or you could set that J equal to infinity. Again, I don't care about conversions at the moment. This is purely formal. And it's good to compress a product of a bunch of these symbols into, into such a compressed notation that comes up handy. Um, and I'll also need a modified T. So we are talking about characters of rational VOA. So you expect modular things to come out. I mean, you do get modular things coming out. So you naturally see theta functions. So it's good to have a notation for, um, for, for those types of objects. Um, so if you have, so I'll, I'll denote this particular book camera by theta of AQ, where if you have A, then you also have Q divided by A. So these symmetric type products is what makes things modular. And again, there is a compressed notation that I'll need and I'll need the Q binomial. So because these two notations will come up often, I've, I've copied them here if you need them at some point. Okay, let's set up some notation for the alpha and D algebra in cell R hat. Um, you have the simple roots, you have the fundamental weights. So you will use these fundamental weights to, to, to talk about the modules of the module that I want for SLR hat, I'll be working with highest weight modules. So if you give me a, a, a small lambda, which is some combination of capital lambda i's, and I can build what is called a highest weight irreducible representation. Um, now you saw admissible levels coming in, in, in a lot of previous talks, but one of the points I want to make is that even if you restrict to what are called integrable modules, we there is a lot to be done on the algebraic combinatorics side to understand those characters. So I'll, I'll stick to integrable modules. So that's the condition. Now the character of these modules, um, I'll again treat it formally. So it lies in a formal power series ring and there is this formal exponential e to the lambda that comes up to keep track of which module you're speaking of. Okay, so here are two definitions which are confusing. Um, in, in how they are denoted. So first is the principally specialized character. So first I'll delete this highest weight, in effect normalizing the characters, and then I'll just set all of these guys to Q. Okay, so that's principal specialization. And then what is a principal character? Uh, you divide out, okay, so that in, 
In a fine real algebra terror of type X n upper R, where X is of type A to B, and R is appropriately one, two, or three, whatever is allowed. In that case, this is the definition. Uh, this here is the definition of what is a principal character. You divide out by principally specialized character of the basic module. So this this story goes back to really uh, Lepowski and Wilson in the seventies, where they they really looked at these these objects. Um, and their papers led to the first appearances of word X operators in mathematical literature at that time. Okay, and in the SLR hat case, this actually equals this, this here. So you take the principally specialized character and then you modify it. Okay, fine. This is the object I'm gonna play with for the next 40 slides or so. All right, so that, that's what it is. Okay, so the important thing to note is there is this L and there is this omega, and there is there is a reason why this is an omega. This is a vacuum space, blah blah blah. At the moment, I don't need that. Okay, but just remember that this is this is what it is. If I say omega, then I'm dividing out by something. Okay, uh, so one key message is that the product form of principal characters. So in terms of these four cameras, that's immediate if you use Wildcat's character formula, Lepowski's numerator formula. But then there is this sum form. I'll show you examples, and this is hard, typically. Right? So if you give a generic Lie algebra at a high enough level, it's not known what, what happens. This is hard. Okay, so what happens at the most, the easiest case of SL2 hack? So these are the principal characters. So if you look at this module, so C0 and C1 are non-negative integers. So the level is C0 plus C1, then this is this is what it is. This is a symmetric product. It has it is periodic modulo C0 plus C1 plus 2. That 2 is because it's SL2. Um, and that's what it is. Okay. So if you have an odd level, then this gives rise to what are called Andrews Gordon identities. If it's an even level, you get Andrews Brasso identities. This is very classical stuff. So what do these Andrews Gordon identities look like? Well, if you look at odd levels, so these two add up to odd numbers. Well, first of all, there's an outer automorphism of SL2 hat that lets you switch these two numbers. You get, get the same answer at, at, as far as the principal characters go. So that's the product. And this is the sum that you get if you actually do the combinatorics. So as I said, this product form comes from um, Wildcat character formula. So essentially it comes from building resolutions of these modules. Um, but this sum form comes about by actually building bases of this, these modules. So you start with a highly redundant poincare work of width type basis and you use vertex algebraic relations to cut it down. To, um, sorry, you, you start with the PBW spanning set and cut it down to a basis. Okay, uh, the anatomy of this sum is also important. So let me explain what this is. So usually you have a Q raised to a quadratic form. Now here you see that this is just a bunch of, this is just okay. Concentrate on one of the variables this is n1 squared, and really you should think of it as half of um, two n1 squared, and this two is is the Cartan matrix of S n2. So the quadratic form is coming from the Cartan matrix. The number of variables here is k, which is roughly related to the level. It's half of the level, roughly. You 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 will usually see four cameras coming up in the bottom. You will see a linear deformation of the quadratic form here, and that tells you which module at that level you're looking at. The hard part is usually figuring out what this terminus is, okay, what, what you put here. So in general, for higher rank um, beyond SL4 and after, we don't know what this should be. That's still open. Okay, so the most famous of these identities in, in this family is what are called Rogers Ramanujan identities. They reside at level three. So this is the sum that you get here. This is the sum that you get for the other products. There are two products that come up. Um, right, so Lepowski and Wilson built bases for these modules and showed that these bases correspond to the sum size. Okay, right. And at even levels, you have a similar story. You have the same anatomy of the sum. You have the quadratic form, linear deformation, four cameras. But now you see that the terminus has changed at even level. Okay. So the point is, we want to play this game for all Lie algebras if we can. 
we are only at the stage of SN3 hat. There are isolated levels, uh, isolated results for other Lie algebras, but such beautiful infinite families are not, not known, the best of my knowledge, for any kind of algebras. So that's the overarching question. Uh, is that you need to find and prove some and product identities related to these affine DOAs or BOAs in general. Um, okay. So now let me talk about SL3 hat, which is the main protagonist for my talk. Uh, so the principal characters in this case look like this. So let me explain what are the things I've highlighted. So first of all, there are three nodes on the Dinkin diagram of SLP hat, and you have correspondingly three parameters to decide your integrable modules, C0, C1, C2. Um, so this is the form of the characters, and you see that it is symmetric in C0, C1, C2. That's because of the Dinkin diagram symmetry of SL3 hat. Also, all these products are, they have a periodic nature and the period is L plus three. So level plus the dual cox number. So I'll say that these are L, so the modulus of these identities is L plus three. And as I said, the, the symmetry is, is really the Dinkin symmetry here. Okay, the point is what are the sum size? I've said this is immediate. You can, we have programs available and you push a button and you, you get this product. That's, that's not deep. Um, sums are what is hard. Okay. All right. So what did Andrew Schilling and Warner did? Well, on the classical Q series side, there is this machinery called Bailey lemma. Uh, we will call it A1 Bailey lemma, but most Q series people know it just as Bailey lemma. And it is, it's great for dealing with things that are essentially SL2. So characters of A11, A22, Virasoro, rational, Virasoros, the singlets, the rank one singlet BOA, the characters of all those are, are pretty much handled on the Q series side by the A1 Bailey lemma. Okay, so more than 20 years ago or 23 years ago to be precise, Andrew Schilling and Warner, they generalized this, this machinery to the A2 root system. And this was a very important work. You can see that it was published in Journal of AMS. Uh, um, and they found out some equal to product identities for principal characters of some, but not all um, integrable modules. Now on the product side, they had this fact of Q infinity. I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, so the point of this talk is that they found many, but not all identities. And now we have conjectures which encompass all the identities, right? So, in some sense, this gives us the full understanding of SL3 hat, but it's still, it's still far away from going to SL4 hat and even finishing the type A case. Okay, so as I said, the modulus of these identities is level plus three. And it turns out that just as an SL2 hat where you had even an odd distribution of levels, here it is distributed modulo three naturally. And for levels that are congruent to one mod three, these are most straightforward in the sense that there is this general framework of this Bailey machinery. You start with a unit Bailey pair, you, you modify it, and you do that machinery, and you get these identities straight out of that. It's, I'm saying straightforward, but this is still difficult. Um, the mod three K minus one identities, they, they come by a certain reflection, which is Q going to Q inverse. And, uh, <coughs> The, the levels that are divisible by the dual coxeter number, they are a little different. And they come up by starting the different Bailey pair that was given by Gesser and Kraken. I'll talk about that. So let me show you again what, what these are. So as an example for level seven, you have modulo 10 identities. This is a level seven module here. And again, the, the anatomy is, is what you see. This, this quadratic form, so first of all, you have Roughly the number of variables grows as the level. And in the exponent of Q, you have quadratic form that's coming really from the Cartan matrix of A2. So that's not hard to guess what it is. This is the, okay, all of this at the end, that's the linear deformation that tells you which module you're looking at. But the hard part really is to figure out what this terminus is at the bottom. Okay. And again, you see that annoying one over Q infinity factor. 
Okay, so as I said, ASW found out some, but not all identities. In this case, it looks like they found majority of the identities, but generically they found, they missed the majority of identities. Anyway, so these are these are the ones missing. By the way, I'm saying they missed, but that's, I don't mean it in any negative way. Even finding one identity is, is almost 90% of the job done, um, because then you can fire up your computers and guess the remaining ones, which is what we did really. Okay, level eight, it has the same structure, but now the only thing that changes is the quadratic form of the very last pair of variables. And again, the terminus has stayed the same. And again, here they, they actually found all of them and they missed none by lost small numbers. Okay, for mod nine, um, you see now terminus has changed suddenly to a QQ poke hammer. And this is all the terminus that there is. I should have also highlighted this last bit. But anyway, so you see the structure changes as you change the modulus of the identity. Okay, so what All right. So I kept talking about this Q infinity factor. So if you actually wanted identities that involve just the character, the principal character, then obviously you have to multiply out by the Q infinity. But now on the sum side, you're breaking the manifest positivity because if you expand out this to infinity, that's going to involve a bunch of signs, right? So people don't like that, but that's all right. Because if you actually look at, if you keep the Q infinity in its rightful place where it belongs, then there is a way to think of this object as coming from principally specialized characters of GL3 hat models. And that's a perfectly respectable Lie algebra. So, so that's fine. It doesn't bother me much. Okay. Now, in the last three years, there has been a lot of activity on this. Um, so, in 2019, Cortil and Welch they they looked at mod seven identities and they figured out one missing identity. They also gave what are called some what are now called Cortil Welch recursions for cylindric partitions. I'll talk about that in a bit because that's important for the proofs. Then 2020. Cortil, Dusa, and Unchu, they, they went one level up. Then in 2021, Warner um, did more work. 2022, Bridges and Unchu did more work. We found conjectures in 2022, which for all levels, but we were only able to prove it for these levels. In 2022, again, earlier this year, Suchioka, he, he looked at level three again. And he actually cranked out the VOA machinery to, to build bases of the modules. So it looks like you're just going up by one level every time, but each of these papers has something new in it. Um, and there are some upcoming papers of Unju where he has gone even more up. And Warner has, I think he, he let us know that he has he's made major progress on proving our conjectures. Okay, so these are, not yet published, so it's not really my place to talk about these, but I have it on good authority that they, they have been able to do this. Anyway, so a lot of activity. Um, okay, so I'll now mention what our conjectures are, and they really are about what are called cylindric partitions, three road cylindric part partitions. So where is this three coming from? That's from SL3 hat. And our conjectures are about bivariate generating functions, Z Q generating functions. And if you set Z equal to one, then you get some product identities which, which we are after. Okay, so what are these cylindric partitions? Well, first, what are partitions? A partition is just, just this, right? You give a number and you write it in terms of non-negative integers in a decreasing way. Order doesn't matter. But if you think about it, it's really a linear partition. So you have boxes and you put numbers in those boxes. If you don't like to do that, then you can think about it as a two-dimensional shape, shape, seven, four, three, two, two. Okay. So what is a plane partition then? A plane partition is a two-dimensional partition. So you have a two-dimensional array of boxes and you put numbers in them, weekly decreasing in rows and columns. But if you don't like to do that, then you can, you can stack boxes in the first column, seven boxes, four boxes, and you get a three-dimensional shape. That's what a plane partition is. It looks 3D, but it's called plane partition because of this reason here, okay? All right, so very classical object. Um, so then what are cylindric partitions? They were first introduced by Gessel and Kratenthaler in 1997, 
And they were first connected to the representation theory of SLR hat by Tingley in 2008. He actually did crystal bases and showed how cylindric partitions connected to characters of integrable modules for SLR hat. So instead of giving you a definition, I'll give you an example, which is better. So cylindric partitions come equipped with a profile. So for us, the profile will contain three numbers because SL3, right? And this will correspond to the module 3 lambda 0, 1 lambda 1, 2 lambda 2. Okay, so you have three rows of boxes in a certain skew shape. Um, you are supposed to take the bottom row, shift it, and copy it on the top. This is not officially a part of the partition, but, but you are supposed to do this. And the restriction is even after you do this, you are supposed to get weekly decreasing in all rows and columns. That's the cylindric condition. And these shifts are exactly these numbers. So shift by three blocks, shift by one block, shift by two blocks. So the shift tells you which module you're looking at. Number of rows is the rank. The total shift, the total skewness is two plus one plus three, six. So we are talking about level six. There is obviously a weight for these. And there is, I'll also keep track of the maximum part. That's, that's seven here. Okay, and in combinatorics, you like generating functions, so you, you build the, the bivariate generating function for, for this combinatorial object. Z keeps track of the maximum part, Q keeps track of the weight of your partition. Okay, so fairly standard. Right, so several important points to keep in mind is that if you really keep track of the maximum part, so if the Z is still there, then you have a cyclic symmetry. This pretty much comes from the definition of cylindric partitions because you're copying the bottom row up. And so you can keep going and you can start at any row really. And that's, that gives you the cyclic symmetry of these cylindric partitions. So you can permute these guys by putting C0 at the end, that's fine. If you forget your maximum part, so you set Z equal to one, then you're really just talking about a single variable generating function. And then these guys exhibit the full Dinkin symmetry. So full dihedral symmetry, you also get reflections. Okay, so these two symmetries are important. <clears throat> so there are three key points which, which, I, which are the underpinnings of why these cylindric partitions are important. First of all, there is a, there is a paper by Borodin and also it's, it's there in the paper of Gessel and Pratt and Taller, but they didn't go the full way. They missed the last two steps of the proof apparently. And it can be showed that um, this univariate generating function of cylindric partitions is exactly the object we want. That's the principal character divided by Q. Okay. So that's the first key point. Cylindric partitions do count principal characters that we want. And this is a quick way to prove the dihedral symmetry of these generating functions. Second key point is that if you actually look at the, the bivariate generating functions, then you have this Corti Welsh system of recurrences that governs these. So, on the one hand, you have products, on the other hand, you have a recurrence, which is beautiful. Um, and the third point, which was told to us by Ola Warner, is that these ASW sums that they found out, remember they found it out 23 years ago and they, they only had a Q in there. There was no Z in there. But you let us know that these are actually expected to be always compatible with the bivariate generating functions. Okay. So, so you let us know that if you just, these are compatible. So we figured out that if you just include this Z to the R1 factor in these sums, then you actually get very close to the bivariate generating function of cylindric partitions, except for this factor. So if you actually set Z equal to one, then these are gonna cancel and you're gonna get the generating function you want. But this is the key object that we need. So I'll call these H functions. So, so some modification of the actual generating function of <laughs> cylindric partitions. Right, so now finally, I am in a position to tell you what our conjectures are. Okay, 
So again, the conjectures are a little bit complicated to explain. So I'll explain to you in, in an example of what happens. So first thing we realize is that there is a certain arrangement of modules which, which is relevant. So you're supposed to arrange the, the modules in a certain way. Uh, so if I look at level 11 modules and think of these now as cylindric partitions pulled by variate generating functions, and you're supposed to arrange in this triangular map. Okay, so you keep the biggest part as the first part, and then the second part tells you which row you are in. So zero row, first row, second row, third row, fourth row. And the, the smallest part tells you which column you are in. Okay, that's just an arrangement that emerged, and we expect that this type of arrangement should be relevant for all higher ranks. Um, and what happens is this gives rise to a triangular arrangement, but at some point this triangle grows and at at some point, it, it recedes. Okay? And it turns out that the guys that are on top of this line have much better behaved conjectures, and the one on the bottom, they don't. And the ones in pink are exactly the ones that Andrew Schilling and Warner figured out. You see that if you make this triangle very big, you're only going to get one diagonal and two guys here. So the law is missing, which is what we had to find out. Okay, so first theorem that we have, it's not a conjecture, this is the first theorem, is that if you give me conjectures or expressions for everything above the line, then we can figure out what it should be below the line. Okay. So, so it's enough for us to tell you what the conjectures above the line are, which are well behaved. Okay. And then we go ahead and provide concrete conjectures. Okay, so just to give you a flavor of how these conjectures look like, I'll explain them, but it's not that important at the moment. The connections of these characters to these other fields is much more important. But in any case, so you see that, again, you now are experts on these types of sums. There is the quadratic form, there is the linear deformation, there is the Z variable, which is gonna be comparable with the cylindric partitions. There is this expected terminus that you have, and in mod 10, these are the sums that you want. That's the arrangement in mod 10 for the modules. And it has a very nice form. So in the first column, you just, as you go down the column, okay, so first of all, this, these A, B correspond to the coefficients of the R variables and C, D correspond to coefficients of the S variables. And this Z is pretty much what breaks the symmetry between R and S. If you, if you ignore this Z, then R and S are perfectly symmetric. Okay, so as you go down the first column, you turn off more and more R variables. As you go to the right in any row, you turn off more and more S variables. That's pretty much the pattern. Okay, so, and there is a similar pattern if your compositions are out of order and so on anyway. And the ones below the line are difficult, but you can actually use the core tables incursions to figure out what they are. As you can see, they are, they are complicated. And if you have a large level, then they become even more complicated. Thankfully, this is a small level. Okay. Right. So how do we prove these conjectures? We, I said we were able to prove these in some low cases. The trick is actually simple. We have these hypergeometric summations. Right? They have certain relations that they satisfy. Those relations are very easy to find out and prove. They're really trivial. It's, each of them has one line proof, pretty much. And all you need to do is to show that these fundamental relations that govern these S functions, they give rise to the core team version functions. So that's, that's the whole point. You have the system of recursions called in Welsh, which you want to prove. You just show that that is. A consequence of these, these relations. But that's exactly what we do, but it requires a tremendous amount of computer assistance. For example, our proof in level seven, if you take our program and print out, I think it's 200 pages of just output, right? So, and what is that output when we are showing that Corti Wells recursions are just linear combinations? of a bunch of these fundamental relations. So the hard part is to find that linear combination, but even if we give you a 200 page linear combination, 
it's easy for a computer to check it because all it's going to do is add up those things and show that you get the code you Okay. So finding is hard. The proof certificate is easy to check. That takes milliseconds, literally. Okay. So our proof technique is not really scalable. And that's why I, I mentioned Ali Unju was able to go a few levels above and he required even more computer assistance and innovations of that regard. <coughs> So this is what I like about this problem. It's related to so many things in representation theory. And I'll also mention, if I have time, it's relations to not theory and also computer algebra and so on. OK, um, just one remark. Uh, I kept mentioning that so, so when, when the level is actually sharing a factor with the dual coxeter number, so in this case, when the level or modulus is divisible by 3, uh, these guys sort of like to stay in a different place. And, and um, we were thinking that these are going to be the harder ones. But actually, there is a very different circle of ideas that controls this family of identities. I did not mention it right now, but it turns out that there is again some upcoming work of Warner, which if you combine with something else in our paper, which I'm not talking about right now, then this pretty much finishes this, this module this family of identities. Uh, so that was surprising because I, I always thought these, these guys are harder than the other ones. But anyway, um, just a remark. OK, good. So a summary of the talk up to now is we understand SL2 hat. We try to understand SL3 hat. We have conjectures. There, are, there is some progress just this year on, on proving these conjectures uh, from various techniques um, and so on. So I'll now talk about, uh, I hope that's the next one. I'll talk about some future directions which might be of interest to people in the audience. OK, so I said that this W algebra is sort of a clickbait. So I'll give you more clickbait. Uh, what is a W algebra? You saw that in many talks now. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, so I might have made some mistakes here. So please correct me. Um, OK, so if, if you give me a finite simple V algebra G and a nilpotent element F, technically this nilpotent element could be 0, but we will take this to be something very specific. And if you give me a complex number, then you start with the universal affine VOA based on this, and there is a functor that takes you to, there's a process that takes you to certain W, I mean, it's called W algebra. Um, and it has three designations, the level, the, sorry, not the, yeah, the level, the, the Lie algebra, and the nilpotent element. So this need not be simple, but if you can take the simple quotient, and in that case, I'll denote it with an, a lower K. OK, so for us, I want to look at the principal W algebra. So you take a very off type A that you okay. uh, So the Lie algebra is SLN. I have the, the principal nilpotent element. So it's, as Robert mentioned, it's the sum of all either positive or negative simple root vectors. Um, and I'll take a very specific family of levels. This is, these are admissible levels. So minus n, so n is the dual coxeter number for SLN hat, and plus a rational number p over q. And I'll actually, so this is how you, I said we denote the these W algebras, but I'll forego this notation, this notation, and I'll, I'll, I'll use a different notation for this. So here n is the rank, so WN stands for W algebra for SLN. And P and Q are these are these two guys. Okay. So by results of Arakawa, this is C2 cofinite and, and rational. <clears throat> and then by further results in VOA theory by um, many people, the characters are, are um, modular invariant. Okay, so you know what happens if you take n equal to two. So it's a two case, then you just get the Virasoro, uh, the rational Virasoro models, Virasoro PP prime. And in this particular case, 
um, Trevor Welch in 2005 had, had given a complete description of how the fermionic characters look like. So we, we understand the SL2 case from a long time ago. Um, okay. So as I kept mentioning, the set of principal characters in general for SLN hat at level L is the same as the set of characters for the WN, but you have to take the first parameter N to be equal to N. These are the boundary admissions. Right? Um, but this equality requires your level and the rank to be co right? Okay. And a summary of what I talked about is that our work has to do with the combinatorics of W3, 3 plus L algebra. Right. Okay, um, and there is a general relationship between the characters of W algebras to the cylindric partitions. And here I have written it for Wn with n equal to n. I mean, the first parameter n is equal to n, but there is actually a generalization of cylindric partitions that covers all W and PQ W algebras. It's in the paper of Omar Foda and Trevor Welch. Anyway, I wanted to just say that. This correspondence between characters and cylindric partitions is quite general. Okay, so one interesting thing that you can do is, is take the rank to infinity. Um, okay, so this is what Andy is an expert on. So there was a physics conjecture by, I guess, Gavardiel and Gopakumar, right? So there is, there is supposed to be this W infinity algebra, and this was con constructed and proved to exist rigorously by Andy in 2017. And the point is that this W infinity, um, well, the, the WN algebras are, are certain truncations of W infinity in a, in a very precise way. I'll not mention what that precise way is right now. Um, but in any case, this W infinity is, is, a, is a VOA over a ring. So it has two parameters, C and lambda, C is, C is the central charge. And the character of this VOA is, is this. Okay. Now, I don't know if you have seen this before, but if you actually include, so if you delete this minus one here, so you get rid of this and you just take one over Q, one minus QD and raise to N. Yeah, so that means you include this extra one over Q infinity. Then this is actually the generating function of plane partitions. So that's a very classical result. So what is this one over in Q infinity? Well, that's supposed to be the character of a rank one Heisenberg. Okay. So if you take this W infinity, tensor it with Heisenberg, you get this algebra called W one plus infinity. And its character is the same as the generating function for plane partitions, which is just as well, because if you take the rank going to infinity limit, then C rank is, corresponding to how many rows you have in a cylindric partition. If you have infinitely many rows, then you are not going to have any cylindric condition, right? So that means you're going to get, you're just going to get plain partition. So on the combinatorial side, this is very well reflected by the combinatorics. So one question you could ask is, okay, this is all good and nice for type A, but what about other types? So a few years ago, Andy and I, we constructed an even spin version of the W infinity algebra. And Andy's student lad has now constructed an even more complicated universe in VOA, but I'll not talk about that. Um, anyway, so the truncations of, of this include principal W algebras of type B, C, and Z2 orbifolds for principal W algebra type B. Now its character is, is this. So what, what is this? Well, you see that the exponents go up by one every time you hit an even number. That's where the even spin is going to be. Okay. This is two and two, then three, three, then four, four, and so on. So one immediate question is, I don't know what, what is the combinatorics of this object. I have no clue. And going beyond, I don't know then what are the combinatorics of, of these other principle W algebras. Actually, even in, forget this W infinity even, even in the previous W infinity case, WN algebras were certain truncations, but there are other truncations. 
of that double infinity algebra. And I again don't know what is the combinatorics of the other truncations. So is there a different way to truncate the plane partitions and get some other type of partitions not cylindric? I have no. There's lots to do in this in this regard. Okay. So in the last five minutes or maybe three minutes, I'll I'll, I'll talk about a very different perspective on on all of this combinatorics. And there is an interesting relation of all of this to, to torus knots and Jones invariance of torus knots. Okay, so uh, for for these next last three slides, um, I'll designate um, highest weight irreducibles of SLN of highest weight lambda by LN lambda. Okay. So this N is the rank SLN. Okay. So let's look at the easy case first. Let's stick to SL2. And let's also look at the torus knots 2P prime. Okay. And uh, draw them so that the ride is 2P prime. So I don't have a picture because I didn't want to use stick Z and I didn't find a picture that has exactly this as the ride. But anyway, so ride just means how many times it loops around, roughly speaking. Um, Okay, so you look at these knots and let's stick to SL2 to begin with and consider unnormalized framing dependent. Framing dependent is really where the right comes in. Okay. SL2 colored Jones invariance. So for SL2, you just have one fundamental weight and you look at this family of invariants, J lambda one, for these knots <laughs> and SL2 invariants. Okay. Unnormalized means that if you look at the unknot, then you just get the, the Q dimension of the module. Okay. All right. So you look at this. Now, it turns out there is a very nice formula, Rosso Jones formula, and Morden used that to calculate this limit. So you look at a fixed knot, SL2 invariance, and you take this J to infinity. Now, it turns out these colored invariants have a limit. And his theorem actually works with all torus knots with SL2 invariance. But in, for 2P torus knots, you get exactly this product, which, if you remember, this was the numerator in Andrews Gordon identities. Okay. And this star just means that there is some small little factor corresponding to the denominator of SL2 that comes into play. But other than that, there is this limit that, that is there. Okay. So the product side of Andrews Gordon identities comes straight out of Rosso Jones formula. You can ask, what about the sum side? Now, typically in this business, the products and sums appear by completely different mechanisms. And there is a paper by Armand and Basbach, and they showed that the sum side of the corresponding Andrews Gordon identity comes by using a certain combinatorial walk model. I don't understand it very well, but that, that's what they did. Okay, so the natural question you can ask is what happens if you change the SL2 invariance to SLR invariance? And I was able to show that the product side story holds. So if you look at torus, torus knots, SLN invariance, but you again look at the fundamental weight lambda one and multiples of that, then this limit exists. So again, this is unnormalized framing dependent invariant, so the right is supposed to be PP prime. And again, you get the numerator of the corresponding principal W. Okay, numerator means that you forget those Q infinity factors. You just take the numerator. And the star means that, again, there is some factor which is independent of the knot that comes into play. You can ignore that. And so if you take this P to be equal to N, then you are then talking about the whole business of Andrew Schilling on our identities. And then the question is, can one adapt this combinatorial walk model to SL3 invariance, apply to these torus knots, and gain some new insight on, on these ASWs? So I don't know that yet, working on it. But yeah, that's the that's the story. 